Fake news, political correctness, and the editorial function. What a subject, and I am, think that our mission is to identify the question of whether students and citizens are self-censoring and whether they are isolating themselves into filter bubbles and echo chambers, and what, if anything, the media organizations all of you work for can do about it. Nancy, you're teaching at Harvard now. You see the way the students are having discussions. Are they self-censoring and engaging in polarized behavior, and why would that be? Um, the self-censoring is a, is a concern to any of us who are educators or who are parents or even in our own conversations about whether we feel that the, the really the richness and the learning that comes from a serious engagement with ideas is being somehow diluted or limited because of people's caution about offending someone. I, I actually think that being cautious about offending people is, is a good thing. You, calling it political, political correctness um, already sort of stacks the deck that this is, this is a negative. And it, obviously during the campaign, it was much cited as, as this very negative trend. You can also look at it as um, a sensitivity and an instinct to courtesy and an awareness that people are going to bring different experiences and points of view to the conversation. Having said that, you hope that, the, that conversations, whether it's between students or with faculty or the people that you encounter in the coffee shop or the pickup line, are, are willing to really engage with ideas without having to hold back and, and run everything that they want to say through a filter that prevents them from from learning from each other. And so I do think that we are, we are trying to walk a line that, that um, has respect as a foundation and courtesy and civility as a foundation of our conversations with each other. And yet there is a fearlessness and a creativity and an energy with which we are looking to learn from each other and provoke each other and stimulate each other and invite each other to think in new ways. And that, I think, is the tension that we are all, all experiencing in different ways. That is a great way to put it, the, the, the balance between the need for civility and respect for different points of view and a willingness to listen to them is one of our central challenges. Liza, you're a great cartoonist to celebrate the First Amendment. You wrote this really inspiring cartoon of the Statue of Liberty as well as of the First Amendment as a pair of wings, which was just so beautiful. Uh, cartoons have inspired uh, terrorism and death as we know from Charlie Hebdo and from the uh, response to blasphemy. And yet, your cartoons and the cartoons in the New Yorker seem to engage in satire and civility at the same time. So how do you see your function as a cartoonist in addressing the line that Nancy identified? Well, I agree with Nancy that the, um, you know, we, we have the First Amendment and we should be able to say or, or draw whatever we want in this country. But as journalists or as, as opinion journalists, which is what I consider myself to be, we have a responsibility to be careful um, as to what, what we might perceive might happen if we drew something a certain way. That said, my colleagues, are, I support them wholeheartedly to, do, to draw what they want. Um, my job as a cartoonist is not only to make people smile, but also I, I'm an individual that I try to make people, um, I'm like a, I feel like I'm a, um, a catalyst or a, um, I can't think of the word, uh, something to spark, a spark plug to make people think. So a lot of my cartoons, not only are in the New Yorker, but I publish on Medium, and I publish my political cartoons there primarily. And, and I share them on Twitter and on Instagram all the time. So I'm, what, my stuff is what's known as a thumb stopper. So people are scrolling through, and they'll stop, and they'll see this colorful, bold drawing and they'll stop and look at it. So my hope is that I'm able to cross boundaries, um, cross, go across uh, these, these pockets of people that, um, that, are, that are thinking alike. So maybe I can speak to other people. And my, my stuff is kind of quiet for cartoonists. I'm not the kind of cartoonist that, that uh, hits people over the head with my thoughts. So I invite them in to think about what I'm thinking or what I'm seeing um, and have a dialogue. Cartoons are dialogue in my eyes. That's a really powerful idea, and there's something about a whimsical cartoon that can appeal to both sides and inspire dialogue and opinion in a way that's less polarizing than uh, the Twitter sphere. 
Louise, you wrote a really moving column where you said this is the last print edition of the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. But we're now going to tribute. Tri 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 uh, no one will notice the difference here, so it doesn't, <laughs> it's not important. Of course I know not. Exactly. They're really, they're the same thing. Yes. So absolutely, <laughs> details. The, the Tribune, last edition. You're now presiding over this flourishing digital uh, version of it. What's the difference between the digital and print version in, in, in the way people react and all the stuff we've been talking about in terms of polarization, anonymous comment, and do you write, and do your reporters write differently for one than for the other? So let me tell you something really fascinating that when I went to school here at Duquesne, my major was print journalism. Uh, and here I am directing a, a, a digital operation, which is really um, sort of, you know, it's very fascinating. But, but I think, um, you know, I, I see our jobs as guardians of truth and as guardians of credibility. And um, regardless of what your platform is, whether it's print or digital, that's always something that I have to keep in mind when I'm talking to reporters and editors at the same time. I mean, so we have this responsibility to make sure that people get um, facts, right? And I think in this day and age, we can all agree that that's been sort of like a, a daily struggle for, our, for news organizations because the issue of fake news is whether or not um, we believe what we're reading or we don't believe it, um, or if, is it factual or is it not factual? So um, I don't really see a difference between you know, the print world and the digital world. If, if anything, we have uh, every day more of a struggle because we are up against, as the, uh, Mr. Uh, Richard from Google was saying earlier, you know, we have all these various um, you know, different ways in which people are getting news now. Um, it's not just the paper when uh, I used to, uh, you know, uh, read the recipes and read the news that editors decided they were going to give me. Now um, the reader tends to be uh, more uh, of, uh, selective and determine, hey, this is what I want to read. So I want to make sure every day that I'm giving facts and, and, and truth and real information. Uh, Tony, you're uh, an opinion columnist uh, at a newspaper that famously has uh, had some clashes between a new owner and uh, a, cart uh, a beloved cartoonist? Well, actually, it's the same owner, but uh, a new editorial director. New editorial director. Right. So, t so how has that affected your job? Do you still feel the independence to write what you think? And has the new media environment and the economics of it affected the way that you express yourself? Um, well, the I just don't have a relationship with the, ed the new editorial director, so I don't really feel um, the more conservative bent of the editorial page has any effect on me. Uh, I think the second that uh, I'm asked to um, conform myself to a more, let's say, pro-Trump slant will probably be my last day there because I just can't. I wouldn't have any integrity if I did that. So um, I, I think. Um, they respect me enough to let me just go in my own direction, even though it's contrary to the editorial direction of the publisher and maybe even the page. Uh, as for new media, uh, I, I, I find that, um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a heavy Twitter user and I, you know, um, navigate around Facebook and other platforms um, just to get this, you know, my column out and so forth. And I like the interaction with um, the readers. Um, so I'm, I'm still, I consider myself a babe when it comes to these uh, other platforms. I'm, I'm, I'm learning them. I'm learning what their limitations are and so forth. So I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm open to, to learning and, and, and growing and, and hopefully um, deepening my ability to speak with integrity using these different uh, platforms. Great. All right, let's try to propose solutions to these problems that we've been discussing so uh, illuminatingly at the conference. So Richard Gingras did ask whether the internet had become a beacon of participation or a proliferator of venom that was dividing democracy. Nancy, you've identified the decline of traditional media intermediaries and decline in trust in those intermediaries as a big source of the problem. You presided over time at a time when it was uh, trusted 
um, and one of the solutions you've proposed is greater transparency and accountability so people know what's going on inside the newsroom. But tell us more about your proposals for how to resurrect trust and filtering in an age without intermediaries and filters. Um, I do think, and, and Marty Barron and Dean Bacay and David talked about transparency this morning. I don't think transparency is the, the solution to all problems, but I do think as a as a, a guild that journalists historically have been particularly allergic to, we love asking questions, we don't like answering them. Uh, we, it's remarkable in some ways how little research there is about, you can, you can learn about the dynamic, the corporate dynamics of any number of industries and organizations. Much less of that is available about media institutions. We don't like letting people in to examine us. I think these are all maybe natural reflexes. And so transparency uh, doesn't necessarily come easily to us of revealing uh, as much as we can about how to go about how we went about reporting a story, why we chose to grant anonymity to certain sources and not others. Um, there, are, there are any number of questions that are much discussed within newsrooms, but that's a bit of a black box. And so to the extent that it's possible to let our audiences, our viewers, our readers, uh, our social platform followers know what goes into tracking down a story, the amount of work that goes into it, uh, and the standards by which we judge whether something is ready to be made public, I think would at least be a, a starting point. There's, a, there's some really disturbing data about this trust, the trust decline, and again, it's across all institutions practically, but the media trust decline has been precipitous. And, and it includes some shocking numbers about the number of people who think that reporters at mainstream news organizations just make up stories and make up stories about the president in particular. That, that's not a marginal 10% of people. It's north of 40% of people. And, and that to me speaks to um, just a failure on our part to really explain what, how we go about our jobs. And I think there's, there's room there just to be much more transparent about how we make decisions. Just a quick follow up, uh, not to get fancy, but the theorist Max Weber said that authority requires mystery. Is there a danger that transparency, personalizing reporters leads to Twitter attacks on their politics and less trust rather than more? Well, I think you put your finger on, on a very important issue, which is as reporters, especially, you know, there, there are no boundaries between, you know, print reporters are on TV all the time and digital reporters are also, I mean, everyone, everyone is operating on every platform and so there are many more opportunities for people to get to know the, the, the face and the personality behind a byline. Um, for women journalists in particular, this uh, has subjected them to really astonishingly disturbing levels of abuse. Right. And, and I had women who left journalism from my newsroom because it just it wow. had become just a part of their, their uh, professional experience that had become intolerable. And, and the research about this globally um, is very alarming. Uh, and even the men in my newsroom were surprised. It's, you know, the men were accustomed to being told they were an idiot. They were not accustomed to having people say, I'm going to come to your home and kill your children. Right. Right. And, and so I think that that is a, is a very significant challenge for how we are going to get bright, talented, motivated, idealistic people, men and women, to come into the profession, similar to getting people to come into, into public life, into politics, when um, anonymous and venomous attackers on social media have such free reign. Wow. All right. I think I think Hugh Hewitt yesterday um, touched upon the anonymity of the internet being uh, impersonalizing, um, you know, the politics of of, of, of destruction um, on the internet, uh, especially um, you know, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and so forth, um, and comments under you know columns and news stories um, is uh, ha is a way of of um, of delegitimizing what we do. And uh, I, I never agree with Hugh Hewitt on many things, but you know, I, I was pounding my, my, you know, pounding the air yesterday because I thought that, yeah, you know, we got to eliminate the idea of hiding behind anonymity. 
I think if my name, my byline is out there, uh, I should expect the, that the person that is responding to me online uh, has the integrity to use his or her name as well. I think that's the only way you're going to have any sort of discourse that has any authenticity. And quite frankly, I'm a big believer in just blocking. I don't give a you know, crap about you know, like having an you know, a ongoing conversation with some person I don't know who's using a fake name. Uh, I don't think that's a legitimate conversation. I, I just block them, and maybe I'm, I'm doing it all wrong. It seems to me that people are like really engaging with venomous critics. I just think, what are they to me? Nothing. And so, if I may could, add could, please do. And let me just, just to uh, press the point. To what degree, Louisa, you're finding that reporters, fearing uh, internet reactions, call them, you know, Twitter mobs, are self-censoring either because they're afraid of the harassment that Nancy's talking about, or afraid that polarized mobs will uh, come down on them if they deviate from the party line. I, 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 what I think is that the use of the anonymous sources that Nancy brought up, and I think you're, you're touching upon that too, that's really uh, sort of affected the credibility of, of news organizations. And I remember as a reporter, I used to like tell my editors all the time, well, I, I have this great story. Um, it's coming from, I have two anonymous sources. I can't name them, and I would push and push my editors. Um, I, I really think it's a great story. Um, now as an editor, I look at the other side, and I see how it could really... Um, affect us, and I remember um, the wise words from an editor who once told me, is that uh, anonymous source going to, if you get sued for the story, is that anonymous source going to uh, sit in a courtroom and testify on your, on your behalf and defend your story? And I think that was an eye-opening statement for me to understand um, how uh, crucial it is for us to make sure that when we're presenting information, we can back it up with, um, with you know, who said what. Oh, I, I wasn't talking about sources. I was just talking about commenters. Um, you know, I mean, I think anonymous sources are, are essential to what we do. Otherwise, you don't get, you know, the Pentagon Papers. You know, you don't get um, all of the, the big breaks that we, you know, the big stories, you know, of, of the last, you know, um, 60, 70 years especially. Um, but I think that there is a culture of anonymity um, um, in social media that is just corrosive and, 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 and basically is leading to self-censorship on the part of a lot of um, people in the media. Um, and, and I think that that's, uh, that we bought this on ourselves by uh, uh, you know, allowing that, that culture to thrive without really having standards that everyone had to meet, even if they were civilians. Liza, when you choose cartoon topics, you know, the, the New Yorker, uh, before the internet, was an unchallenged authority and no one could react except orally you go to a cocktail party and say, I saw the great cartoon. Now there can be a lot of commenters. Do you choose your topics and frame your cartoons in anticipation of the comments and reactions or no. not? No. And how, and how do you formulate, that's great, okay, <laughs> wonderful, good for the First Amendment. And, and, but uh, tell us more how there's something really unique about the cartooning form as you express it, this sort of gentle satire which is pointed but not polarizing. Say more about it, what your aim is and why it is that cartoons are able to do this in a way that uh, print is yeah, not. Yeah, it's hard. it's hard to explain uh, the process. Like, I will um, pay attention to the news, of course, and, and be on alert for what I want to do a drawing about. Um, and um, for my kind of work, I pretty much do drawings that are not attacking specific individuals necessarily in the, in the government or in the, in the culture, but talk about cultural issues or talk about political issues or bigger, broader things that I see going on in the culture. Um, and sometimes that means I don't, I may be really angry about something that happened in the government or in our politics, um, but I may not draw about it because I can't find an angle that, it, that I see as a bigger picture idea to, to draw about. That's, that's my work. Um, and I had the luxury of not having to produce for an editor on a daily basis. I don't, like many staff cartoonists, they have to come up with something every day, or at least three times a week. I, I do it when I feel moved to draw a cartoon, so I'm lucky that way. And the New Yorker doesn't, I don't, the way it works with the New Yorker, people are curious about this, I'll just be quick. We all submit a certain number of cartoons every week, and they either buy one or they don't. So. Um, that's their process. It's been that way for almost 100 years. 
Nancy, more solutions. Let's really dig in. So trust, uh, so anonymity uh, is a double-edged sword, as we've just been discussing. What are other ways of rebuilding trust now that the intermediaries are gone? Uh, Richard Gingras said Google has an initiative to try to rebuild trust. There are technological solutions. Uh, Facebook could prioritize on the news feed links that people actually read. So it turns out fake news travels more quickly than real news because people share inflammatory headlines without reading them. And Facebook creepily can tell whether we've read a post, uh, and they could choose. And in fact, the new Stanford uh, project led by Richard uh, Persily is uh, proposing to put higher on the feed stuff that people read, so to promote reason rather than passion. That's a modest technological solution. Other stuff along those lines? Well, for starters, let's just stop using the term fake news. It is a... Uh, Can we add political correctness to that list? Yeah. yeah. Um, I get it's, it's short and punchy and, and doesn't take up a lot of space in your headlines, and there are all sorts of you know, bad reasons why we default to it, especially since the alternatives are horrible. Um, but one of my colleagues, Claire Wardle, who's one of the world's experts in, in what we refer to as information disorder, uh, refers to face F asterisk 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 news um, will not use the term, and it's partly because it has been so distorted from you know its original. We sort of understood oh Macedonian teenagers who were making up stories in order to make money. It has obviously um, transformed significantly and and come to mean any number of things, none of which are good for institutions or for trust or for journalism or for civil discourse, and among other things, it, it um, elides the, the important differences between misinformation, which is information that's just wrong, it's a, it's a mistake that someone made, but it, like an honest mistake, um, malinformation, which is actually true, but intending to do harm. Mm. So, Revenge porn is malinformation. Uh, the leaking, leaked emails, illegally leaked emails. The emails are true, the information is true. The intention behind publicizing them is to do harm. Right. In the middle is disinformation. Mm. Not true, intending to harm. And it is that space, that disinformation space, where you see the Facebook posts that tells people you can vote by text and all of the different voter suppression efforts, all of the, the, um, the, the information that was shared uh, that isn't true, that is meant to, to damage individuals or damage institutions, those are, those are poisons in the body politic. And so I think if we don't have the right terminology and toxicology to address them, then it's going to be very hard to come up with a solution. So, so I agree with the way that she explains the, the difference between the terms, but the, the question then becomes is does the average reader out there who's reading our news uh, know the difference or know better? Because when the president uses that term over and over and over, it becomes part of, of, of the conversation, right? So nobody's going to care about the difference, even though you're right. So what do we do then? Well, what, 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 what we need to do on this panel is figure out how serious a problem it is. And, and thank you, Nancy, for malinformation, misinformation, and disinformation. If we focus on disinformation, intentional propaganda sent out by bots or by people abroad to create chaos, Kathleen Hall Jameson's book uh, on the subject argues that it did make a difference in the election, although that's obviously contested. My question to you, Tony, as a journalist is, how serious a problem do you think disinformation is on the internet, or how would you go about measuring it? I think disinformation, I think, I think Nancy has it uh, absolutely correct. Uh, you know, it, it is, you, first of all, you have a credulous um, electorate, and you have, uh, all you had to do is look at 2016 and understand that uh, something um, outrageous and unusual happened there, and um, it was probably the, I'm no historian, but I, I'm wondering if it's perhaps the first election in American history, uh, given the fact that there were 78,000 votes um, that were the difference between uh, Trump um, and Clinton in terms of um, the electoral college um, uh, victory, 
it's the first election that was probably significantly decided by disinformation, um, things that people believed um, that were just straight up lies um, that motivated them to vote in a particular way. It has had tangible impact on uh, our, our country and our history. And so, um, so how do we deal with it? Uh, I think we have to frankly acknowledge the fact that our uh, democracy is hackable. It is hackable by disinformation and that we have to make a concerted effort um, to root out the sources of disinformation. That means that we might have to change the whole um, uh, structure of, of you know, Facebook and our social media platforms and um, maybe they need to be redesignated as uh, utilities uh, so that we can actually use some strong regulation to affect the way um, that they that we interact with them because disinformation is just going to be an intrinsic and inherent part of social platforms um, so we have to um, be realistic in how we approach them so this puts the question squarely and the first amendment says congress shall make no law bridging freedom of speech if facebook were regulated as a public utility and congress said facebook you must root out disinformation that would arguably violate the First Amendment, because Congress is not supposed to tell any individual to distinguish between fact and opinion. Jefferson said that that is a distinction for citizens to make for themselves, not for the government to make. And then even if Facebook on its own decided to tell us what was true and what was disinformation, that would put huge power in the hands of uh, young uh, people in t-shirts and flip-flops in, in the valley who uh, ha are unreviewable. So, Louis, this is a really hard question, but if we th posit that disinformation and malinformation are problems, how, if at all, should we expect Facebook and Google to solve it? Wow. That's wow, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Richard Gingrich is spending $300 million to figure out, so maybe we can get some of it if we can solve it on this panel. <laughs> well, I don't know how they're going to do it. I can tell you what we've been doing as news organizations yeah. in trying to root out misinformation and disinformation. And I'll give you an example of something that happened to us um, you know, last year, um, because I think that may sort of bring in uh, various topics. Um, we had, um, and because I, th I think the issue of, of misinformation and disinformation extends beyond politics. So we had an, an accident, a really a fatal crash uh, in one of the suburbs here in Pittsburgh. Three women were killed. Um, uh, on social media, uh, there was a video that appeared that went viral of these women prior to uh, the fatal wreck. These women were shown on Snapchat, um, you know, drinking, vodka, singing, uh, not being completely carefree about, um, you know, what they were about driving. You know, they were, really, I mean, they were drunk driving. Um, they were just singing, and they didn't really sort of have any sort of filters, and, and everybody was sharing this video, and um, so our, our, when the video got into our hands, so we said, well, do we share this video with our readers? You know, what do we do? What, what's our role here? And um, how do we d determine if the video is true, right? If it's real, it could have been created by anyone, by anyone right? Um, so we decided not to, you know, share the video, you know, on our site. Um, and I, I often think of, of that um, situation um, because, you know, I couldn't confirm if the video was accurate, if it was true, if somebody had created it, right? So should I have, the question then becomes, should I have, should we have posted that video as a, as a news item because everybody was sharing it out there? Um, you know what I mean? So I think we took it upon ourselves to sort of um, determine whether something was disinformation or misinformation, right? So I guess the question then becomes, should we have done that? Do we have, so here we have the power to do that. To, to make that decision, right? So that's what you're suggesting, that, yeah. that other organizations uh, do similar things in trying to root out misinformation, disinformation. Well, I don't think this is news. I'm not gonna share it or, or post it for my readers, right? But isn't that the, late, the, the regular gatekeeping function of, of all you know, news sites? I mean, newspapers do that, you know. On a day-to-day -day basis, we right. do that, I mean, right? That's, right. that's no different. I, but I think that the problem here is so unique um, when you have a hackable democracy, uh, we have to come up with uh, creative 
um, ways of dealing with it because it is not something that's going to become, you know, it, it's not like bots are going to become more egalitarian and fairer, you know, um, with the next election. They will not be, um, you know, um, more pro, um, you know, progressive, let's say, if you, you know, or whatever. There, it's just going to get worse. I mean, I think what we have, it's, it's like, you know, I, I think a good parallel would be uh, global warming. You know, you can sit around and sort of have an academic discussion about, you know, the best way to affect, um, you know, um, the bring the economies and our self, our long-term self-interest in line with uh, a means of, of, of stopping, you know, um, the, the um, you know, fossil fuel use. Um, or you can wait 40 years when, you know, the sea levels rise and so forth, then, you know, your species is eliminated. I mean, it's a, it's a 15 alarm fire, what we have here. Um, and, and I think um, disinformation at the heart of the democratic uh, process is a big problem. That's a powerful analogy. Uh, so, Liza, tell us how you would feel as an artist and satirist and cartoonist being reviewed editorially by Facebook and Google. And the example I want to give is the innocence of the Muslim videos. A few years ago, both President Obama and the President of Egypt called on Facebook and Google to remove the innocence of the Muslim video on the grounds that it allegedly started the Benghazi riots. Facebook and Google looked at their hate speech policies, which forbid the criticism of a religious group, but not the criticism of a religious leader. So in other words, you can say, I hate Muhammad, but not I hate Muslims. Where did that distinction come from? A young uh, Facebook head of content who is an anthropology major at Bowdoin read John Stuart Mill and somehow came up with the distinction between criticizing a religion and criticizing a religious leader and wrote it into the Facebook uh, content policies. Huh. So as a result, huh. Facebook said, no, this, the, the video criticizes the prophet, but not the religion. We're going to keep it up. Google, which adopted the Facebook policies, did the same thing. Later, it turned out the Benghazi riots seemed to have been caused by something else, so it was a good decision. It was more protective of free speech than President Obama and President of Egypt, but it came from this young anthropology graduate who basically just made it up. So would you feel, would you feel comfortable having your cartoons about well, the prophet or about anything else determined by policies made up by young anthropology no, I graduates? I no. no, I wouldn't. I think that's problematic. It's, I think it's been talked about in other panels in the, today and yesterday. Um, um, and what that, that, that brings up an interesting point about satire, how, um, aside from your question, um, the notion of punching up versus punching down. Um, when the Charlie Hebdo deaths happened in Paris, um, there was a lot of discussion among cartoonists about um, whether, whether Charlie Hebdo artists had gone too far in, in making fun of, of Muslims in their cartoons. Um, they made fun of Christians and all other religions as well. It's just what the French humorists do. But um, many cartoonists, Gary Trudeau among them, would write, and I wrote about it too, we, our responsibility really is to punch up, to punch to the leaders, to the people in charge, not to people on the ground, not the people who practice the religion or whatever. And I, I personally feel that's the way to go with satires, to, to take that responsibility seriously. Um, but I want to mention, I want to ask a question because it was brought up yesterday. What about the antitrust idea with, with having more than one Facebook or more than one Twitter? Does that, does that solve a problem? I don't know. Well, the, I'm, not a, I'm not a lawyer. The question, it, uh, treating Google as a public utility, even assuming the politics of it were there, uh, would still, uh, the government would be constrained in what it could order uh, the platforms to do when it comes to speech because speech uh, is protected by the First Amendment against government regulation. So Google has argued in court that its search algorithm itself is protected speech and that uh, in response to charges that it's prioritizing the search results of its own companies over its competitors, which it denies, uh, it says you can't force us to tweak the algorithm anyway because the algorithm itself is speech. Hmm. And this is what Justice Elena Kagan has called the weaponization of the First Amendment to basically prevent economic regulation of the companies on the grounds that all of their activities are protected speech. So all this is to say it's a complicated question and simply treating the companies as public utilities wouldn't give the government free reign to tell them what they wanted. 
but, but Nancy, what do you think about both the proposal to treat them as public utilities and the general wisdom of asking the companies to serve this editorial function, which they're not currently doing? Well, I'm a little skeptical of the notion that that they are, they are just pipes, they are just platforms. I, you could argue that an algorithm is an editorial function and it has been, it, it may not be a human sitting, reading and making a judgment, but algorithms are created by humans. Uh, they, that is another black box. There's a lot that we don't know. Um, and so to go back to the transparency question, how big a difference would it make uh, for, for more of the, the interior calculations of the platforms to be, have to be visible of how stories are prioritized or not. Uh, much more importantly is, as we head into another election, is how do you know who is paying for ads? And part of the problem of the disinformation that was spread the last time is that it was impossible for candidates to combat a, f a false rumor because they didn't know that it was being spread because those ads were so carefully targeted. Or if there were ads that were, were saying that you know, a certain polling place was uh -huh. in a different place than it actually was or giving any kind of information that would confuse voters or deter them from turning out. There were rumors of, of active shooters around polling places. Um, there, were all, there was all sorts of really malign information spread leading up to and on election day. And so, uh, and if much of that is being spread, uh, paid for by dark money and spread in ways that it can't be policed, can't be seen, can't be monitored, uh, then you really do have a problem. You don't even know what you're fighting then. It's, and so I think that, that to go back to transparency, how much uh, is it reasonable to expect to know about and how much transparency and what would that look like for who is paying for ads and who, how they're being targeted and how that is working. We, we're so far behind what we know about television ads and print ads compared to, to what we're seeing on social platforms. Louise, do you, what's your perspective on the platforms given the fact that a lot of your hits must come from Facebook links as all media organizations do and would you want them to be in the business of making content-based decisions? Absolutely not. Um, what's interesting, though, in, in all this conversation, as I was listening to Nancy speak, um, I have uh, two teenagers, and we talk a lot about Facebook, but they don't get anything, any of their news from Facebook, because Facebook is for old people, <laughs> and, which is kind of fascinating uh, in and of itself, and this, so that's a whole other story. Um, but I, I, I do well, think... Well, it owns Instagram, so that may... <laughs> Instagram, Snapchat, I mean, so it, it's almost like... Uh, we, we, uh, but um, but no, I, I think um, the issue with uh, with Facebook um, and and trying to sort of make sure that they uh, understand. I mean, I, I'm not sure Facebook is too big. I, I think. I mean, I don't know that we can sort of come up with. Um, I mean, I know that we want to sit here and come up with solutions. I'm not sure that we can. Right. I mean, I think it's uh, it's upon us. I mean, right now, I know that in our newsrooms, every day we have to worry about um, you know creating headlines that are going to be searchable, so that you know we get enough hits. And, and it, it's it's the reality of how the news world has evolved today is that we have to pay attention to analytics and we have to pay attention to uh, what people are reading. Um, I'm not sure if that's great, but I think back in you know, 20, 30 years ago, we didn't pay attention to um, what, what people were reading. We just certainly just, we fed, you, know, you guys created a magazine and, uh, and you know, Time Magazine and you read it. This is what I'm supposed to read. Now I have the uh, flexibility to read what I wanna read. And uh, so we are paying a lot of attention to what people are reading and giving them more, right? Are those metrics consistent with free and open, robust public debate? So I was at the old New Republic for many years, and then uh, at the very end, the owner who had it for just a bit put up in the newsroom uh, flat screens with how quickly pieces were traveling, and the most valued pieces were the ones that traveled the most. And we all know as journalists that there's huge pressure to write pieces that travel. It's, it's is that more, consistent? It's demoralizing. It, I mean, because basically, you're, you're, um, if you're just responding to market pressures, at what point uh, do you give up your identity as a journalist? I mean, you're, you know, our job is, 
is, is not to give the people what they want. Our job is to give the people what they need. And that may sound condescending at times. It may sound, you know, um, that like we are making ourselves, you know, judges or something. But, you know, our, our job is actually quite simple to, to uh, go out and report and gather the news um, without fear or favor. And sometimes folks don't like what we come up with if we just leave it to, um, you know, public engagement to determine what it is that we're going to put, you know, on our platforms. You know, we've lost it. And, and you think about, um, you know, I'm a so-called controversial columnist. You know, my stuff will not fly if there was ever, you know, just a, uh, you know, uh, if you ask people, well, what do you think, Tony should stop writing about race, right? And they will say, sure, you know, you know, race is not a problem anymore. You know, we're, we're post-racial. You know, people believe that nonsense. And so, you know, you can't leave it to folks, to um, the public to dictate what the news is. And I know that's a controversial idea. I hate, I absolutely hate seeing those metric boards because, you know, oh, my stuff does well, but what if it didn't, you know? But, and you think about, you know, people in the newsroom, they, they it's like, how come my piece that I, I sweated over, you know, blood and tears isn't doing well? It doesn't mean anything about the quality of the piece. It just means that it hasn't engaged with the broadest possible public, you know, it, it isn't junk food. You know, you think about the, you know, the New York Times piece on, on Trump um, three weeks ago, two weeks ago about the sources of his wealth. You know, not a lot of people in the general public read it or cared about it. It was still groundbreaking and important and it is, you know, advanced our understanding of, of our president, you know, by leaps and bounds. Very powerful point. Our job as journalists is not to give the public what the most of them want. Give them what, what they need. What society eat your spinach? It's necessary in a <laughs> that's a yeah. You know what? Spinach is better for you than all the other crap. Yes, it is. Spinach is excellent, and so is broccoli. <laughs> with, um, broccoli too. So it's all about a balanced diet, right? So you give them a little bit of what they want and a little bit of what we believe as journalists, as you know, powerful watch watchdog journalism. So yeah, we you have to. That's the challenge that we have, right? Uh, to make sure that we have a, a balance uh, in, in the diet that we're giving our readers. Yeah, that's the what last, I wanted yeah. to concur with Tony in that I, I, uh, I, for the last 10 years, I've been doing cartoons about women's rights and feminism. Right. Just get, putting them out there, putting them out there, and not mm -hmm. getting much response. I don't pay attention to metrics either. I think. Thank you. So, uh, I hate And that. now, feminism is an okay word, right. an okay subject, and it's a popular right. topic to draw about. Right. So it's, you know, Whatever. Nancy, as you're, you're an editor of you know, one of the most distinguished uh, magazines, and how do you balance the economic need to have pieces that travel against your sense of what the public requires? Because ultimately, the, in the grand scheme, the business model is that you have to be trusted and you have to be valuable, and chasing clickbait in the end is going to undermine the core identity that makes you valuable in the first place. I, I will say, Given that we're at a conference on the First Amendment and sitting in the middle of a great university, I do think one of the solutions that is urgently needed is, is the growth of a field of study of public interest technology. Hmm. And we've seen, you know, we saw the field of public health come out of the medical schools and public interest law out of the law schools, and we are going to need this rising generation who are the first generation of digital natives whose whose instincts about how information travels are, are different than, than older generations, and who, when it's their turn to be the lawmakers and the regulators, I suspect, um, will have a more sophisticated and subtle understanding because we are in such a dramatically transitional time. And so uh, when, when you look at the hearings in the Senate with the, with the representatives of the platforms as these issues of regulation are explored, it just did not seem like a fair fight. And the, the, the difference in knowledge and expertise and understanding, technological understanding particularly, 
um, is significant. And so for universities to commit themselves, and it'll have to be a collaborative interdisciplinary effort of, of the engineers and the computer scientists and mm -hmm. the political scientists and the psychologists about how these technologies work, how information moves, what we understand about them. Uh, all of those disciplines are going to have to create the next generation of public interest technologists who will serve a public good about how we think about these challenges. What a wonderful note on which to end. Madison talked about the need for citizens to deliberate in public interest rather than private interest. We have identified the ways the technologies are speeding up deliberation so fast that it's creating digital mobs, and Nancy has rightly inspired us here at the home of Carnegie Mellon and Duquesne and all of these great universities to bind together to promote the use of public interest technologies that will save democracy and promote free expression. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>